Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, for those of you who may have read the description that uh, we wrote up advertising the lecture, there's quite a bit of detail in there. Basically, what we want to talk about today is, is there really a difference between uh, normal, quote, uh, civilian education and military education and training, uh, how they go about doing things, and then the end results. Uh, that uh, theoretically come out the back end uh, of this. Uh, one of the things that is always uh, controversial is should the military even have its own education system and things? And there's thoughts on that on both sides. So we'll talk about that too. Next slide, Dick. Here's a little overview of what we're gonna do uh, today as we uh, run through this. Uh, again, uh, what I mentioned just a minute ago, is this education and training different uh, inside the military? And if so, how and why uh, is it different? And one of the things that in the civilian world and also in the military that theoretically is supposed to drive everything is the goal, the end goal that you have uh, for whatever project or event or uh, iteration that you're trying to do. And in this case for the military, uh, the education and training focuses on quite a spectrum of goals. Uh, they want to try to improve individuals. They want to try to improve a unit. Uh, they prepare for a totally different kinds of events than civilian education, and we're gonna talk about that. So they focus on conflicts and contingencies and not necessarily everyday events. And then finally, it gets very complex when you reach the higher end of education uh, where we talk about na national strategy and execution of national strategy. And we're not gonna go into any of those in great detail or we'd be here for longer than we have. So that's basically what we're gonna do. Uh, we'll talk about the methods, how the military goes about uh, their training and it'll be kind of a, a we'll go through training and then work our way into education. They seem to follow almost in a, uh, in a curve, uh, one beyond the other. We'll talk about emphasis uh, along the way. Uh, and then the military way, uh, what, you know, we'll actually talk what's the difference between training and education. Is there a difference there? Uh, between the two and, and you see these words uh, bandied about and they talk about uh, them almost interchangeably in a lot of cases, but in actuality, they really aren't uh, the same and they are, there are different goals and, and products for the education. Uh, in the military, uh, quite a bit differently than in, in civilian life, the training and education is focused on uh, the three basic levels of ranks and organization inside the military. So there's independent and different training and education for enlisted people, NCOs, non-commissioned officers, and uh, officers. And we'll be talking about that in a little bit, what the differences are and, and uh, why that's important. And then finally, we'll finish up with what the military calls professional military education, and that's for officers. And uh, generally speaking, it runs anywhere from the, the gamut from uh, your very first educational training, if you happen to be at, at uh, oh, West Point or the Academy or one of the beginning things, all the way to education uh, for general officers and things. And we're gonna talk about that uh, as the kind of final uh, section of the briefing. 
Okay, why why is military education and training a different? And uh, I guess the one of the biggest reasons is that is, uh, you know, how do you measure success uh, coming out the back end of this? And uh, some of the uh, these are more academic terms here. You see underneath this measure of success that are high level goals. And one of the first uh, goals is to provide an intellectual architecture. And that's a big word for mean, meaning to teach people how to think and give them the ability to think. And so uh, we'll talk about that when we talk about the, the lowest level training all the way up to the most sophisticated and complex education that we have. Uh, one of the goals, and this is is actually dictated by Congress is that training and education in the military must contribute to stable civil military operations and relations. And the idea there is that you don't develop a dichotomy. You don't have an independent military. You have essentially total integration uh, at all levels and there should be no conflict or no separate goals between the two. And then finally, uh, the system theoretically uh, maintains a capacity for critical analysis. And I'll talk about that when we talk about training and we talk about education and we talk about skill sets. And you know, for someone who's been in both worlds, but been in the military and then also in the business world, uh, I can tell you without a shadow of a doubt that critical analysis is, is highly prevalent in the military and not very prevalent uh, in the civilian world. You, you rarely see critical analysis uh, to the depth that you see in the military. And we'll talk about why that, why that happens that way and why it's important. One of the things in the military that they do in training is they try to focus on the most difficult problems first. And that's kind of reverse logic in a lot of cases. And what this is, is contingency planning and the fact that uh, the military has to prepare for the worst case scenario uh, as the going in position. And then hopefully by doing that, you're able to address uh, any lower level event or conflict uh, that should uh, happen en route. Uh, what this goes down to is in the modern environment, this requires or demands a daunting command of quote, everything. And that includes a much longer list than that list that you see there for history, economics, logistics. Those are all the things that you study uh, in a military education scenario to try to prepare you for a conflict and things. And so it's, it's a quite a broad uh, list of things uh, that are involved as some uh, very highly technical. And then uh, the bottom there, we're gonna talk somewhat as we go along about complexity. And then one thing you have in the military that you typically don't have in the civilian world or in the business world is you don't have opponents that every day are trying to actively subvert what you're trying to do. And so every, at every course along the way or every step you take, you have an, a potential opponent who's trying to counter whatever it is you're trying to do. And so that becomes uh, another event that, that enters into the training and the education. And here's a little bit of the command of everything. This is a simple little chart that was developed by a vendor think tank uh, to try to uh, analyze how to make the support. This is a support for COIN. You can kind of see it in the middle uh, C-O-I-N, counterinsurgency operations. This is for counterinsurgency operations in Afghanistan. And this shows you the interaction of events and activities in order to try to be effective in countering an insurgency. 
And, and I would uh, theorize that this is way too simple, uh, a diagram for what you, so this gives you some idea um, what the higher level leadership is considering. And this is, this is why it does require specific education, uh, specific thought processes. And one thing we sometimes don't do as well as we should in the military, uh, and they don't in the business world either, is cooperation. Uh, requires a massive amount of cooperation and communication, and those are other issues uh, inside the problem. Next, Dick. Here's this intellectual architecture, an old uh, Dwight Eisenhower in the bottom there, he had one of the, the uh, quotes that's used quite often when we talk about uh, intellectual architecture. <laughs> and what this boils down to is uh, in the military is that you have to continually be building leaders and teaching leadership. Uh, and so uh, sometimes uh, the, the hard knowledge and the, and the actual academic courses are less important in some cases than actually building into your training and education the ability to lead effectively. And it is not easy. Uh, I can uh, assure you to both either do it or teach it. Uh, again, you see this stable civil military relations popping up and that does at every stage. Uh, and that's a congressional input that is, uh, that shows up in every document or every uh, bit of funding that comes out that has to do with education. A culture of reflection. This has to do with, uh, with this same critical analysis bit in the next uh, line down is that you have to be able to take time to look at yourself critically and determine what you're doing wrong uh, at the time. And you have to be able to take criticism constructively. And so uh, that's a real talent to both be able to give criticism and accept criticism uh, constructively. It, it doesn't just happen. It has to be taught as part of a culture. And then is there a link between educational excellence and military performance? And this is probably true in the military world and in the civilian world is it's really, really, really difficult to measure a direct influential uh, value between education and training and the actual performance. Uh, in the military, you can do it two ways, individuals and groups. Uh, by an individual, uh, does it improve your performance? Uh, we would say in the military, the measure of success is, are you promoted? What's your promoted rate? What's the promotion rate of people who have been educated versus those who have not? And they, they would, the people who look at those things would say that's a direct measure of, of a contribution. And then finally, education as a strategic issue. And that goes back somewhat to that complexity chart we looked at uh, in the thing. And also in this, uh, in this area, it has to do with the ability to see the entire world as a, as a stage, not just your individual unit um, or your individual country. Uh, so it's, uh, we end up getting very broad in the thought processes at the higher levels. This is something I learned in preparing this uh, presentation that I didn't know uh, going in is that uh, initially education was a civil responsibility, even for the military. Of course, our first military technically in the United States were the, were the volunteers in the, uh, in the Revolutionary Army. And those were the true citizen soldiers. And as they came out to volunteer, 
uh, the first formal military education ever uh, took, force, took place at Valley Forge. And that's when General Washington had, uh, and this is, the, you have to look at the, the date of Valley Forge, 1775 or so. And uh, what happened is we'd already been in the war a while and what General Washington had figured out is it was extremely difficult to command troops who couldn't read and write. 90% uh, of the people that were volunteering couldn't read and write. And so he tasked the chaplain corps during Valley Forge to teach reading and writing. And by the time they came out that winter, they were pretty successful in teaching everyone to read and write. And it made a huge difference. You can see a dramatic difference in the performance of the Revolutionary Army before and after that event. That was actually formalized in 1789, and they formed a chaplain corps as educators of the army. And that was the first time uh, where actually written down was the fact that uh, there has to be education of the military by civilians. The military is essentially a highly specialized complex corporation uh, so theoretically, a lot of the training is the same, and that turns out to be true. Uh, economics, uh, leadership to a large degree, budgeting, planning, uh, logistics, uh, planning, uh, those all transfer back and forth uh, almost directly. What doesn't transfer back and forth is combat. And so we'll talk some about that when we get there. Of course, the military struggles all the time between individual goals and military goals. And so each individual going through training or through education is trying to improve themselves and uh, gain an advantage either inside the military or for themselves once they leave the military. And the military has to uh, balance out and say, are they getting the payback uh, for the time, effort, and money invested in individuals uh, contributing to the success of the military goals. And then, of course, like both military and civilian, the idea is you have to continually assess, evaluate, and change as you go along. Okay, how does this military training start? Now we're going to get right into this kind of thing. Uh, this, is, uh, this is basic. Uh, introduction to military life. This is where your basic recruits enlisted and uh, officers uh, are first introduced to the military and the quote, military way of life. And as you can see, uh, there's a lot of similarities in all these pictures and we'll talk about that in a little, in just a minute. Uh, this training varies by service in length and content. Uh, the Air Force is the shortest at eight, eight and a half weeks. Marine Corps, the longest uh, at 12 weeks for your, quote, basic training. Coming out of that, you really don't have any military skills or any education skills. You've just been exposed to military life and discipline. Now, you notice in those previous pictures, there's a lot of uniformity, and that is intentional and continual throughout the basic training and follow-on training. The haircut and the uniform are important because they establish that link between each person and the unit. Uh, they are also exposed to a pretty heavy a dose of history and tradition uh, in the beginning, be in their initial training, because that's a, a core part of all of the military and is that there's an attempt to instill that uh, into the new recruits in basic training. Of course, all new recruits, and this is something that's never stressed, one of the major parts of their training is safety and first aid because all of the things we do in the military are inherently dangerous. And so uh, one of the first things that everyone is taught uh, is safety and first aid. Uh, 
Then guess what? Physical readiness. You saw that in the previous slide to a certain degree. Uh, the idea in basic training is to stress people both uh, uh, mentally and uh, physically and keep stressing them. And, uh, and so then through the course of that stress, this ends up being a confidence building uh, part of the training. And that is accomplished both in the classroom and in exercises with some of the exercises specifically de developed just to build confidence. And they're not typically to build confidence in individuals, but to get, build confidence in teams and teamwork. And then finally, if you've done your job right in this training, by the time you get to the end of your 12 weeks, you've increased each individual's self-esteem. They have a real sense of accomplishment and they have identified a group identity uh, with their unit and their service by the end of that time next day. Discipline is a major part of all training at every level, even from the beginning to the most sophisticated. The reason for that is in the military, as we said earlier, the big difference is everything you do is to prepare you to go in harm's way, and that requires discipline. Uh, you, therefore, you continually are being presented with physically and mentally challenging tasks. And the military is very uh, good at weeding people out uh, who cannot complete the tasks. And so it's, it's one of the things that the military uh, does that you don't see nearly as much in the, in, in the civilian world is uh, a failure is a part of the program uh, and, uh, and there is an intentional uh, challenging of people to make sure they can meet the standard because it's the safety of everyone around them uh, that relies on that. And now things have changed in the last oh, 20, 30 years where technology now is, is a bigger and bigger part of every part of training from the most basic to the most sophisticated. Um, there's technology involved and it requires individuals with higher mental capability than we ever needed before in the military. And sometimes now we have trouble getting those in the military, both in the uh, officer corps and in the uh, enlisted corps, you're running into a problem where uh, with a volunteer uh, military, attracting those people is not easy. The other thing we talked about earlier is that the, this training for the worst case scenario or just in case training uh, in the civilian world, you emphasize there's various terms for it, but just in time or just enough training, or you have just the right amount of people, uh, just the right amount of, of uh, inventory. Uh, that's something the military doesn't really do. They have a, oh my gosh, what if this happens mentality, and they have to be prepared for that. So they need bigger inventories, bigger numbers of people, uh, more pieces of technology that often seem like they're underutilized. And that's because of the nature of the, of the mission, which is to be prepared for the absolute worst case scenario. Uh, we hope it never happens. We try to train to prevent it from happening. And that's what training and education is all about, is trying to prevent the worst case scenario from happening and hoping you never need to actually employ the skills that you're training. Uh, in the past decades, and we're talking here the last 30 years or so, only about 10% of the military tasks, and that's what we're talking about, what the military actually ended up doing day to day over the last 30 years, only 10% of those tasks involved actual armed combat. Uh, but that's what you're preparing for. So that's kind of the scenario. Next day. 
Okay, here's a little bit of training. Now we're, uh, we're out of uh, the basic training. We've got your discipline, your identity, uh, teamwork. Now you go into your, your different combat specialties. And you, this is only a small number of uh, the things out there that you can go into or be trained to do. And on some of the slides, I've put the follow on training. So once you get out of your eight to 12 weeks, uh, then you spend an X number of weeks or years preparing to get ready uh, for your follow on job. So in the top left corner, those are infantrymen, basic infantrymen. And so once they uh, graduated from the basic course, then they get another 14 weeks of training in infantry tra tactics, teamwork, weapons, uh, survival, and the skills that they will need uh, in order to participate as an infantryman. And that just gets them ready to go to a unit and begin more training. Each one of these slides has a similar kind of a thing on how long it takes. Uh, fifth, that one in the top middle there, that's artillery. Uh, that's 15 weeks. And uh, in, the, in the military now, 90% of all artillery is, is armored and mobile like that. There's very little uh, any other kind of artillery, although it still exists in the Marine Corps. The, on the top right, that's the engineering corps, some very complex operations. This is one of their most complex bridging operations, but they also do things, things like mines, minefield clearing, road building, sh uh, ship harbor building, uh, all kinds of events that have to do with civil and mechanical uh, engineering. Lots of skill and uh, education required. Uh, the one in the middle left with the green slide, that's air defense, that's a Patriot missile system, uh, 18 weeks. Now in the middle there is the Air Force pilots. And you can see that they are considerably longer uh, training and that you still go through the basic training that everybody else does. And then you start something like this. The two years, 15 months, takes you 15 months to fly the big airplane uh, in there. That's a 135 tanker. Or to, to get to the point where you're fully qualified in an F-16, the fighters, then it takes two years uh, from the time you start your pilot training in order to be able to do that. That's a long time uh, for training. Right now, that's about $2.5 million per pilot of a fighter guy in order to get them trained up. Uh, we're gonna talk more about this a little bit later on, but we have a thing in the military called active duty service commitment. And what that means is if the Air Force gives you or the military gives you any training, you owe them money, or not money, time. For the amount of money and time they spent, you owe them time. So if you are trained as a fighter pilot, you owe them now, currently this year, 10 years. So you get done with your two years, you owe them 10 more years. So you'll have 12 years in the military before you could get out. Uh, as a fighter pilot. If you're the tanker pilot there, you owe them six years, so it's uh, less. 100 days on the right-hand slide there to be the basic space operations course. Now, I, I put in uh, aircraft carrier on the bottom left. There's no specific courses because there's hundreds of specialties on board that ship. Pilots and radar operators and uh, deck crew operators. But the thing about an aircraft carrier is it is without a doubt the most complex single operation known to man. It's the da most dangerous and you just don't go do that uh, out of the block without years of training. And so by the time people get on in here, it's uh, get on those ships, the the uh, supervisors and the commanders have been doing those jobs for 20 years before they move up to an aircraft carrier. 
and do that. The thing that surprised me, and I didn't know this, is the bottom middle there for drones. That's a predator drone, which can be either reconnaissance or attack drone. Uh, it takes one year of training to become qualified in that, and six years of active duty service commitment. And then lower right, uh, that's also some artillery there, rocket power, rocket uh, artillery, multiple uh, launch rocket system, uh, 15 weeks. So that gives you an idea what it takes to get at any of those particular things. Then that's for the individuals. As you go along, then as soon as you finish one of those 15 week to two year, then you go into your unit and this is where uh, life diverges from civilian training most dramatically. Because as soon as you are trained as an individual, you then start training as a group, unit training. And not only do you train in small units, uh, anywhere from five man teams up to uh, oh, several thousand in the carrier battle group there, uh, number of individuals involved, uh, you start training for unit goals. And then you train to come to uh, link those units together into bigger units and then carrier strike groups and then strategic employment of nine carrier strike groups. And so these are the, the ongoing training that never stops. We just, this is what you do day to day as a military person. This is what they call training as quote collectives. And you have crews, which are, can be two to five people, groups, teams, units. Uh, then each one of these smaller groups is commanded by a leader. Uh, for a five-man team of SEALs that we showed on there, the commander could be a, a chief petty officer uh, or equivalent of a sergeant. Uh, for the carrier battle group, uh, it's usually a two-star general. There's a buzzword that you'll see all the time in the military once you get out of your individual training, and that's called combined arms training. And what that means is once you are proficient as an Air Force person, now you have to learn how to interact with all the other services and understand their terms, their capability, their training, and how you all fit together. And this has become you know, uh, not only a buzzword, but a matter of absolute necessity over the last oh, 20, 30 years uh, where it's really become a paramount to do that. We try to educate to develop uh, military and political leaders that understand this training and execution. Uh, we continue to have problems uh, and challenges. Uh, you can imagine what it's like to try to get Army, Air Force, Navy, and Marine to all work together when they all buy their equipment separately. So all this technology out there uh, and none of it is built to work with the other persons, not Army, not Navy. And so at least in the last 10 to 15 years, there's been a real concerted effort so that you can't do that as an individual service. You can no longer have something that only you've developed for your own individual service. It has to be developed cross service so that you have this another buzzword interoperability between the communications, the technology, and the people. And the problem, once again, is none of these things uh, will work if you haven't trained the people. Uh, Next stick. Okay, now how do we transition from training uh, to education? Uh, this is where we start developing leaders from, the, and this essentially happens after basic training from then on at every level. Uh, we start blurring the definition of training to education. Uh, the United States leads the world uh, and the Western countries uh, lead the world, uh, primarily because of the United States leadership in the training of enlisted and non-commissioned officers, NCOs. 
Uh, we and our closest allies are the only uh, militaries in the world that have what you would call a professional NCO Corps who are trained and stay in the service for 20 or 30 years. And so uh, that's what gives you the capability in many, many, many cases to outperform your adversaries because you started that from the time they entered the service and you instill that uh, professionalism and educational requirement in them for the entirety of their career. Now, the, the little white chart in the left is a little hard to read there, uh, but essentially what it's trying to tell you in the major headings there are that you have to take the ability to intake data, to develop your intellect, to develop your presence. That means, can you communicate? How do, you, uh, how do your peers, your subordinates, and your superiors perceive you? The other thing that is always developed at these levels and every level of the military is character. And we're gonna develop, we're gonna talk about that once we get into the more professional military education. Uh, I'll tell you from my own personal perspective, it's quite the shock uh, to go from the military a scenario where if somebody in the military says they're going to do something, they do it. Uh, when you go into the civilian world, I never saw that happen ever. Uh, so it's, uh, it is quite the change. You're really used to people uh, taking the ball, and if they say something, uh, they mean it. Uh, then you as you go from the top there of knowledge and things, then you go to the output at the bottom where you're actually able to do stuff now. Uh, once you've developed your intellect, you've developed your career, learned how to lead uh, other individuals, and then you keep developing that capability as you go, then your output improves. And it's a continuous loop and a continuous cycle and that's where we talk about the feedback, uh, the, continu the uh, continual assessment and the continual change uh, as we do that. Now in the lower uh, corner, the lowest part of this uh, slide, that's uh, professional military education where senior officers now are starting to de be developed uh, along the same lines. Next slide. This is kind of a, a standalone slide. Uh, it doesn't really have to do with uh, training and it doesn't really have to do with education, uh, but it's very critical to both. And that's research and development. And the military spends billions of dollars every year on research and development. And that's not only for technology, but for training and education. And uh, there's more than 2 million uh, military guard and reserve. Uh, that includes uh, 800 uh, unincorporated, uh, that does not include 800 uh, unincorporated civilians. And uh, the biggest difference here is in the military, R&D or research and development is not to achieve a proprietary advantage uh, over another company. It's not to achieve a profit. It's to try to be able to address the worst case scenario. And it, so it responds to this, what they call mission mix at the bottom. So the lowest level response for military now is usually disaster response and peacekeeping. And you see that often now where the military deployed out if there's flooding or storms or uh, even civil unrest. Uh, they deploy the military. And, you know, that's part of the problem with the now changing the training of the military because uh, those are not in military's wheel set, the training in uh, wheelhouse. They're not trained to do those roles. And so, uh, but they are a highly trained, disciplined force that can be moved on a moment's notice. So, they're employed and sent out to do that. We do a lot of humanitarian response in the military. Hostage rescue happens all the time. And 
Every day there are small unit covert operations going on around the world that nobody knows about uh, on the uh, things. And so that's another thing that happens all, and it's, that is all under the umbrella of research and development. So I just threw this in here as a kind of an outlier slide uh, as a link to, to get us from uh, somewhat from training to education. Okay, this is, this is quite the long statement here uh, from the Association of American Colleges and Universities. That's from the, the uh, Countrywide Association. And the, the reason that this whole long uh, quote is in there is because uh, it describes a quote, uh, liberal education. And if you read down through there, uh, it fits almost exactly what the military is looking for in the education of its officers. You wanna help students develop a sense of personal and social responsibility, transfer intellectual and practical skills, communication, analysis, problem solving. Those are all things that the Association of American Colleges and Universities says their universities should be doing. So hopefully the military equivalents are trying to do those same things. We're gonna start off at the lowest level here uh, for PME or professional military education and that's the service academies. Uh, they're listed there in that first little bullet and, and after them that number is how many uh, students or uh, cadets are uh, attending each one of those each year. So the incoming classes each year are about 1,200 uh, in the, the three major ones and then the Coast Guard, uh, it's about 300. Merchant Marine Academy, I, that's in there and that's kind of an interesting uh, sidelight. I'm just gonna give you two or three sentences on the Merchant Marine Academy, Academy and Merchant Marines. It doesn't sound like that should have anything to do with the military because of the word merchant in there. But uh, although they are dwindling now, there is a huge uh, seaborne force of contingency equipment that is always at sea on huge ships. Uh, probably one division's worth of tanks. Uh, probably one division's worth of equipment for infantrymen. Uh, probably enough uh, fuel to sustain carrier groups for six months. And artillery and everything you can speak of are out there floating around on ships as contingency resources should something really, really bad happen. Well, guess who mans, runs, and operates all those ships? The merchant marines. And so that's why they're lumped under the service academies uh, in this scenario. Now it's interesting for those of you who don't even care is that uh, for the academies, the main service academies, you can only go if you're nominated. Uh, and that's by a congressman, a senator, the president or the vice president. That's it. If you're gonna get into any of those things, you have to have a nomination from one of those people. Uh, and it's extremely competitive, more difficult to get into any one of these than to get into Harvard, no doubt about it. Um, thing. So obviously there's a lot of demand uh, and they're really, really good schools. Now they combine military and traditional college education. And again, what do you get on the side? Discipline, tradition and team building uh, in addition to the standard traditional college education, which can be liberal arts or highly, highly technical in any of these uh, institutions. Coming out of there, if you graduate from the, uh, one of the academies, you owe five years 
Well, guess what? We just said, how much do you get for some of these other? Well, pretty soon those they they add together. So pretty soon you're you're owing Uncle Sugar a lot of uh, a lot of years. Here, next. It's a commissioning source, and I'll tell you that, uh, and I was not Academy, I was ROTC, uh, went in. Uh, if you graduated from an Academy, you have a huge leg up over all your competitors who did not. You are the, the, the premier source inside the military, and they, those are the people who have the priority to get the jobs and get promoted. No, no doubt about it. They do try to instill and are mostly successful, uh, instill leadership capability. Excuse me. And uh, service to country. <coughs> it's full immersion. What does that mean? That means every aspect of your life they control, every second. So therefore, they can mold you pretty well over the course of four years. We talked about this a little earlier, honor, integrity, and ethics. Uh, you can get thrown out of the military academies easier for a honor violation than any other reason. And so <clears throat> it starts to instill that. It's, that's why it's really hard when you're military people and you now in our day and age see military people with no ethics. You see them every day on the news, in the things, and that's not the way it's supposed to work. Uh, so it's really disappointing for the people that were in the military or uh, grew up in that system to see how some of that uh, has been lost. They do stress science, technology, and engineering. Uh, so I would say, I'm guessing now, uh, I used to know, but I'm guessing now 85% of the students are studying uh, a STEM, science, technology, uh, or engineering field, just because that's where the future is in the military. They try to develop interpersonal skills. They're not always as successful as that because one of the things you get in the military because of uh, the rank and the discipline is sometimes those interpersonal skills are not so good. Of course, they education, they, uh, they emphasize physical education, which is mandatory. You don't go to the school and not participate. And practical application, uh, not just academic. So when they take a course, then they go do stuff. Uh, every year in the summer, each one of these cadets for a month goes to an active unit and immerses themselves in a unit to find out how the things they study are being used day to day. Next day. Now for the higher level people, and this is what I was really involved with at the end of my career, the professional military education for intermediate and senior level officers. That's for majors, our intermediate, senior, lieutenant colonel and colonel going to school at that level. The big driver for this was, was passed in 1986, and that's the Goldwater uh, Nichols Act. And it defines everything that has to do with this joint, and that's the key word, joint professional military education. That's the combined arms leg. So from 1986 on, uh, there's been an extreme, extreme emphasis on joint and getting the services to work together and train together and be educated together. There's two levels of colleges, as I said, intermediate for majors and senior level. The, all of those, there's, I didn't list them all, there's about 10 of them, are all accredited master's degree granting institutions. Uh, when I was in the, on the faculty at the Naval War College, we went through our first uh, certification, accreditation, evaluation by the Northeast uh, colleges and universities, and it was a zoo. For two years, they were all over us doing the thing, but we got accreditation 
uh, to, to be a master's degree granting now every two years they have to update that. And they're all accredited and they're all current. Uh, how do you get to go to that? This, if you go to one of these schools, well, it's a little different than in colleges. You don't, nobody gets to apply to any school. You are, quote, selected to go. And you are selected to go when you are promoted. So when you're promoted to major for intermediate schools, there will also be what's called a schools list that is associated. And it's a subgroup of those who are promoted. As an example, to major, 50% of the candidates will be promoted to major. Of that 10%, of that 50%, 10% are on the schools list. So these are theoretically the best and the brightest of the majors. For senior service, promotion to Colonel, 15% uh, are selected. Of that 15%, 5%. 5%, that's a low, low number, are on the school's list. If you're on the school's list, you don't necessarily get to go. You're only on the list. And then before each school year, they have another board that meets to pick and choose the actual candidates who get to attend this school. The Navy is a little different. All the rest of the services it is extremely, extremely competitive to want to and get to go to these schools. The Navy is just the opposite. Um, they don't care. They don't select their people. Nobody in the Navy wants to go. Uh, and so it's, uh, it's quite a different story. And the, there's pressure on them every year still. And they, even doing my research for this, still they don't make their quotas Every year, the Navy doesn't do this. Kind of thing. So to comparison, Harvard, Harvard, you, uh, the 6% of the people get selected, Harvard Law, 10%. And so the percentages end up being about the same in the military as going to Harvard Law uh, when you get to the people who actually get to attend. Again, critical thinking and complex environment. The, the faculty is non-traditional in that uh, in uh, all of the, the schools, including the Naval War College, it's almost a 50-50 mix of civilian faculty and military. The military that are on the faculty are always uh, theoretically, once again, for everybody but the Navy, uh, chosen to be the absolute top in their uh, specialty field and they always have to be higher ranked than the people they're teaching. Uh, that's kind of a military thing. Uh, civilian people are also, uh, amazingly enough, uh, some of the, uh, to me, because they're teaching in military schools, uh, some of the uh, most highly thought of uh, civilian professors in their fields. Now, one of the reasons they like teaching in uh, these military schools is uh, there's no, a requirement to publish uh, like there is in civilian universities for tenured professors. They can get tenure. Uh, they're on a designated pay scale, so everybody gets the same. There's no uh, competition to see who's got the biggest paycheck. Uh, and they are pretty much free to do whatever they want, developing their courses and things. And so the military schools have no trouble attracting the very highest level of civilian faculty. One of the things that's a, uh, that is difficult when you're doing your accreditation uh, is they do have extremely high graduation rates. A graduation rate out of Harvard is 97%. Uh, graduation rate out of the senior service schools, 99 plus percent. Very, very low. Uh, part of that is cultural, is the, the services think if you're sending your top people there, they should be able to make it through. Uh, and so uh, you do have a somewhat higher graduation rate. I myself have failed uh, four people out of the school, not just the, uh, we often had, we had people uh, who didn't fail but did not get the degree. 
were not ever awarded. We had probably, we, we beat Harvard in that category, but we had a few people who didn't make it. But I myself uh, failed three people and essentially your career's over. If that happens, you're done, you're toast uh, when, when that happens. And, and so it's a big, big deal. And if anybody's interested some other time, I can talk to you about how, how the whole process grows when you actually are gonna fail somebody. And it's a little bit different than, than a civilian. Yeah, it's, it's quite the convoluted, long drawn out process. A career progression. Here's what we're talking about. How do you measure your success? In the military, as I said, usually you measure your success by how well these people do after they graduated in getting into high level jobs and getting promoted. Intermediate service level schools, majors, 90, greater than 90% of anyone who's gone to an intermediate service school gets promoted to the next two ranks. So they gain 30 or 40% percentage wise in there by going to an intermediate. It's not, it's really hard to measure uh, for senior service school because the next promotion level is general and they pick generals differently uh, in all the services than they do everybody else. And less than, uh, less than one half of 1% of the eligible colonels make general in any service. So it's a little hard when you get there to, to have that, use that as a measure uh, for success. One of the things though, you cannot be a general officer if you have not attended in residence a senior service school. So even the Navy has to step up now and uh, do that because they cannot promote anybody to admiral uh, who's not been to a senior service school. So they're having to come on board a little bit more. Next slide. In the senior uh, colleges and intermediate colleges, it's about 300, they're, they're 10, month, 10 month long, these colleges. And so they're shorter in duration. A typical master's degree program is a couple years in a civilian university. Here you're doing it in 10 months. However, you're in class seven hours a day, every day. There's no messing around here. Uh, 350 to 450 contact hours. Those are in lecture or seminar format. Uh, I gave both lectures and seminar, of uh, course, seminars. In your lecture, you'll have, depending on, uh, in our case, junior or senior class, about 750 people in the lecture. Uh, seminars in ours, we could have no more than 14 in any, in any seminar. That was the limit because they figure your span of control was too high if you got more than that and you didn't have an effective communication chance going with any. Typically we would have 12 in a seminar. Seminar demographics were extremely important. This is the J in the JPMA thing, service mix. And so the powers that be would spice every seminar to make sure you had the maximum mix of each service, civilian people, different ranks, different specialty areas within the service. So theoretically, you had somebody in each one of your seminars who was an expert in a field you'd never even heard of before. And it really did work. And I'll tell you one thing you'd learn, and I think you learned this in the civilian world as well, is that being on the faculty, you learn 10 times as much as your students. Uh, one, because you have to be prepared for them every day, and these are top 10 percenters. These are no wink, weep people, you know, and so you got to be prepared. And then the things they come up with are, are extremely challenging uh, when you get in a seminar mix. So it's really good. Reading and writing intensive. We had about 100 pages a night of reading, required reading, every night. Along all those uh, various fields there. Writing all the time. Uh, as you look down at the bottom there, it talks about the tests. Uh, we had three tests uh, in, our, in the Naval War College. Pretty, and I, I attended the Air War College, and it's pretty much the same. Uh, we had three tests in both of those colleges. The first two tests were three hours long. 
the last test in each one was six hours long. Uh, in the six hour test of the Naval War College, there were three questions, three essay questions. That was the test. Open book, do whatever you want. One page, typed. That was your response to that essay question. No nine pitch stuff. So you had to have something that was readable and not written on the head of a pen. So, and what that teaches you is how to digest, compose, and put on paper something in a concise, a very, very complex idea and scenario in a concise way. And that's the idea. The people I failed couldn't do that. They could not read and digest it and come back with the thoughts and put them, that's why they failed. They might have been really good at whatever job they had before they got to the war college. They couldn't do that. And so anyway, uh, papers, two 10 pagers and one 30 page paper. That was what we had in both of the schools, the one I went to and the one uh, that I taught at. Metrics that matter, peer review. You have to have that in any academic information uh, any academic organization. Quality of the faculty. Uh, we got reviewed every year. Uh, that's part of the peer review is for the civilians. Uh, of course, the services uh, reviewed each one of their candidates. And we did have people actually who were taken off the faculty, even if they were assigned and they would be there for one year and they would be asked to leave uh, because they just, did not meet the quality that uh, people were looking for. Of course, the civilian, we talked about that parity. They did have tenure, they did have compensation. Uh, it was not a problem uh, getting, it was much more difficult to get quality service instructors than quality civilian instructors. Uh, one of the biggest uh, rating uh, things, uh, the rating uh, examples for instructors was the student feedback and their ratings of the instructors. Uh, you could live or die on your student ratings uh, on, as an instructor on that. And the, the thing about it was is their instructor ratings were expected to be every bit as cogent, written as well, and as concise as all their tests and everything else. And so you weren't just getting uh, check boxes and this guy's a 10 or a three. Uh, they had to write a paper and say why they thought what they thought. Uh, lots of diversity, uh, tr trying to ensure these things. And then of course this jointness thing. And then feedback from the field. And we talked a little about that. Uh, there would be surveys sent out to general officers, of course, all of whom had graduated from a senior service school. And so the general officers every year would get from the Joint Chiefs of Staff, not from us, from the Joint Chiefs of Staff, they would get a survey of how their subordinates were performing based on their education. And a whole list of items for them to go through. Do that. Next, Dick. So that pretty much brings us to the end of uh, PME and to the end of uh, uh, training and education. This is what we said we were going to do. Uh, on here and we worked our way through uh, each one of these uh, tasks uh, and areas. And so I guess now I'm ready to, if anybody has any questions or if anybody's still awake, we're uh, ready to go. You can go to the next slide, Dick. We have any questions? Oh, I have one. Oh, somebody's I, coming. I, I was thinking this. I was hearing, I'm hearing, I'm hearing my. It's kind of confusing. Anyway, I was thinking how this would be to be presented to uh, high school kids. This is such a great presentation that uh, I'm very, I was very, very impressed with it. And I think some. 
there was so much knowledge in there that is, you know, most people don't know that it would be wonderful if that could be presented through a counseling service or something if someone's interested in going. Well, you know me, I'm willing to talk to anybody anytime. So if, if I could figure out how to push that noodle, I'd be happy to. Okay, I'll think on that. <laughs> yeah, if you know if you know a contact or a, an avenue in uh, uh, or somebody that wants to talk about that, let me know because uh, I am, you know, I am more than willing to do that anytime, any place. Okay, it was great. Thanks. That's some chat questions. Can you read that? Or do uh, you read it? it says, what subject was your area of expertise at the senior service school? And the second question is, are the academies tuition free? Yeah. Okay. I had, I had two areas of, uh, uh, I'm answering the first question first. What was, uh, what was my area of expertise in the senior service school? And two real areas. Uh, my first area was uh, operational planning. And that doesn't mean anything to you if you're not a, a, a military person, but there's essentially three levels of conflict that we talk about uh, as military uh, students. Uh, there's tactical, which means those are the people where we, we looked at the pictures of the infantrymen and the fighter guys. And when they're doing their jobs uh, on the ground or in the air in their particular close area, that's tactical. So planning to succeed one-on-one -on -one against another small unit or against another uh, aircraft or a group of aircraft in an immediate uh, localized short duration conflict, that's tactical. Operational is let's go get that. Uh, we got 27 hostages on an island and we need to go get them off uh, using uh, the Navy, the Air Force, and the Marines. And when you start planning that operation, that's an operational effect because it requires large units, large deployments. Uh, multiple sets of resources in it, and somebody in command over the whole thing to direct it. That's what I taught was how to plan and prepare for those kinds of operations. That was my main part. Now, I was also, they in the, in the uh, colleges or universities, the military ones, they have a chairs just like they do in civilian university. You can have the logistics chair or the Spanish chair or the psychology chair. Well, I was this space system chair. I was the Alan B. Shepard chair of space education. And so I, uh, when I first got there, they didn't have an independent curriculum about space systems and using them in operational planning or strategic planning. There was, there was none of that. So I built that curriculum and then I taught those courses. And so those are all, uh, one of those is a core course. There's only one core course uh, out, of this, out of the space uh, curriculum. Uh, it's about you know, 10 hours of instruction uh, but then there were several, uh, just like in any university, uh, there, were, there were several optional courses that you could take that were not part of your core requirement, and I taught all of those. So two things, operational planning and space systems. Are there academies? Oh, yes. Are the academies tuition-free? Oh, yeah, even better than tuition-free because the, uh, the, while you're going, you get paid. Uh, and you get paid not as a, because you're not a, an officer yet, you're, uh, you're training to become an officer, but you get paid at an enlisted level. And so uh, not only do you get your room, uh, your board, uh, your tuition, and all the summer things, and transportation is paid uh, back and forth, 
uh, those things, but then you do get a, a certain amount of, of actual pay. I mean, it's not a stipend or anything. Uh, you have a pay grade just as if you were in the military and you get a pay check. Uh, so it's really, really a good deal, but you're paying a good price for it, uh, too, as an individual. So it's not really free. <laughs> comes with a long term. Comes with a long term, and it comes with a lot of pain and suffering. <laughs> Any other questions? I just had one. The the uh, This seems to, I would think, the education process has, has accelerated greatly and expanded greatly since the time of uh, World War II and so forth. It, uh, just from what you're describing and some of the things I have read in the past, it's got to, is there there's, must be a huge number of people just involved in the educational process. Oh yeah, like it's uh, and that's part of the R and D that I talked about. It's it doesn't really fit your normal definition of R and D. But what happened was after World War II, and you're exactly right at the break there of where where it first started, is the country and the military realized nobody knew anything about how to plan big operations. They had no idea uh, going in. Coming out, they had all kinds of people who suddenly had a lot of expertise that they'd learned the hard way. And so they, they being the, the military and civilian leaders at the time, at that point, started to develop schools and places to send uh, people to, but it wasn't yet uh, at the uh, college level or thing, it was individual planning schools. So it would be logistics for large operations and you would go and it would be a one week course and then things like that. But yes, that really started to drive the education process. Uh, but what, you know, what they really found out too, though, and, and, and this once again goes back to the thing that how does that line blur between training and education? So when you send somebody to learn about how to do logistics in a large operation, is that education or training? And a lot of people would say that's really training uh, because what you're teaching them is how to accomplish a specific task with a specific set of inputs and abilities to do that. And so it's kind of fits a cut, uh, cookie cutter mold. You can come in and do this and away you go. Education is how do you react to something you've never seen before? Uh, and, and this is the part where that ha only developed in the last 30 years, probably, where it's come about that they, they once again, uh, being the, the, uh, the highest level leaders of the military and people uh, in Congress and, and in the executive branch said, we need people who can think more, not just do. And so that's the, that is the, the, uh, the line or the, the continuum between training and education is how do you get people who can think and then translate that ability things into the ability to act. And so you're, you're right, Dick. And it's, it's been, in our scheme of things, relatively recent. Is there any idea, do you have any idea how, what percent of the military is involved in, or is the training, educating part? Oh yeah, there? very, very high amount. Uh, I'm gonna say, uh, I'm gonna say 25%. I consider that a very high amount. That's a pretty high price to pay out of your total resources uh, in order to get, when that's not education, that's also training. Uh, but uh, that's a pretty high price to pay in resources. So you better be getting some payback. Yeah, what do we got, another one? Uh, at what level are tactics and strategies? How do you win battles and wars taught? Uh, the, in the intermediate service schools, they focus on tactics, which are battles. And so in the intermediate service school, you focus on battles, 
on uh, what they call, the, the army calls maneuver, uh, how you uh, can place or, uh, or move the forces you have on the ground, uh, how you develop your logistics to support an operation longer than you normally might be able to, but it's focused at the battle level. And so when you study history at that point, you study individual battles. Uh, and we go all the way back to the Peloponnesian War, and we, and, you know, and that's a long time ago. And we study the Peloponnesian War from a, uh, this happens to be, and this is more detail than you probably want about tactics, but that's where you learn about a tactic that's been used forever uh, since then, and nobody really knew why. It's called the Cane, which was the name of the place where the battle took place. And what it means is, is you have a line against line that are flat like this, and you intentionally let your opponent push you back in the middle like this until you have a big U-shaped area, and then you close the U at the end as part of an intentional maneuver. And in order to get to the point where this makes sense, we studied the Peloponnesian wars on how to do that and not get yourself in a stew. So in the intermediate service schools, we study tactics. We don't, and tactical planning, we don't really get into operational planning because those people are majors and they're not going to be making those decisions. They're going to be employing as a major in the, uh, in the army, uh, you would be, you would never even be a battalion commander, which is a thousand people. So that would be a lieutenant colonel. So, uh, so, so your area of expertise and where you're gonna be employed, you might be a deputy battalion commander. So you need to know how to employ a thousand people. Think that's tactics, how to do that. By the time you get to the senior service school, then we're into the operational because now these are lieutenant colonels going to be colonels or colonels already. Uh, in the school, they are now studying operational and strategic planning. What's the difference? Uh, operational planning is there are actual battles going on out there, many of them, and you're trying to plan how all of this fits together to win the overall goal. And this could be like a theater of operations in World War II, Europe. Europe would be an operational battle. The strategic study is also at the senior service school, and that is how do you win the war? That's the strategy, and how do you plan to be able to win the war? That's taught at the senior service schools, and that's, that strategic planning is primarily for general officers and senior staff officers who go to the Pentagon or their uh, individual service headquarters, and they're involved. The strategic uh, is, all, is almost solely planning. And so that's where that is taught, and, and that's the group of people who are taught that, are the people who are going out to either become general officers or work on a general officer's staff. Those are the people who, who are taught uh, strategic uh, planning. Any further questions for Rocky? I guess not. So with that, we'll be closing up the meeting here. Thanks, Rocky, for another very insightful presentation that uh, we would have never heard about otherwise. So uh, thank you again for this. Uh, we'll give you give people one last. Uh, Last chance for a question, anybody? If not, then we will be ending the meeting. Thank you all for attending.